the time that he was called until we meet him today in a very uncomfortable and agonizing situation, he stood very firm in his faith, never wavered. Um, when he was called, this is in Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abraham, get up, leave your country, leave your people and your father's household and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and all peoples on the earth will be blessed because of you. What a promise and that was something that was you know too good to turn down when he said, get up and move, go where I want you to go, do what I ask you to do, and he said, yes, Lord, here I am. I'm, I'm moving on it. And it's amazing, the uh, name of this lesson is the Lord will provide. He had nothing, he took nothing, <coughs> and he did everything that God asked him to do. He accomplished everything, and he became a great hero and model for generations and for nations for all time. But you know, after he was called, well, you know the, the circumstances before Abraham was called, he had some uh, reverses in his life. God had called him and said, I want you to be the father of many nations. But then his wife, Sarah, Sarai, uh, he was Abram and um, she was Sarai. They changed their names a little bit after they uh, had their encounter with God, but she did not bear <coughs> children. And she was very uh, uncontented, and she wouldn't wait for what God had promised that, you know, that uh, Abraham would have progeny and that he would be a great nation and he would have many sons and many daughters. And ultimately he did. But right there in the beginning, they went through a long stretch of time when nothing, nothing was happening. And so they decided they could fix it themselves. And Sarai said, I'm going to send my, my handmade men and perhaps I can raise children through her. They will be your children, but we will raise them and we will accomplish this uh, promise of God. And somehow that never quite works out. When God promises something, he delivers. The Lord will provide is the name. And when he promises he will provide something, it will happen. At any rate, uh, the child Ishmael was born to Hagar, and that was that proved to be, you know, unsettling to the household. And Sarah just uh, it said, you've got to send them away. Now, God did provide for Hagar and Ishmael, and he became the father of great nations, too. And of course, Abraham fulfilled his covenant promise from God by God said, I will make you the father of many nations. And he is the father of faith for uh, Judaism, for Islam, and for Christianity. So he is a model of faith, really, to most all people who have a, uh, a belief in the Creator God. At any rate, we have that call of Abraham, and uh, he moves from Ur of the Chaldees down to the land of the It's amazing how he came into, uh, you know, into the possession of the land. God provided leadership for him. God provided everything. They had no, in fact, there is a comment here by one of our authors that said something that I think is, is most people don't know what to make of the Old Testament. People frequently ask, how can God's people go from killing tens of thousands of people in the Old Testament to loving and evangelizing all people in the New Testament? Part of my response is to remind people that God does more of the fighting in the Old Testament than do his people. Lately, however, I am beginning to hear a common response to that statement. People often reply, I am sure that the Israelites believed God was fighting for them, but all ancient peoples believed that. Why should we think God's people were any different? 
This is a great question, and the Bible has a great answer. When other nations had no standing armies, what other nation had no standing army? What other nation spurned strategic military alliances? What other nation refused to acquire military technology from Egypt, like chariots and horses? The Israelites took none of these things into battle, and yet they took possession of the promised land. It is one thing for a nation to claim that God fights for them and another to make zero provisions for national security. It is true that many ancient nations claimed that their gods fought for them, but only Israel dared to march around a city many days and blow trumpets and wait for the walls to fall down. It is one thing to say we trust God, but another thing, to place our future completely in God's hands. In today's passage, Abraham is given the uh, opportunity to do this because he arose to the occasion. He is the model of faith for all of us. And I thought that was a, a, good, a good comment uh, about Abraham. Uh, we go from that to Genesis 20, 21. And you know that for a long time, uh, Abraham and Sarah had no children. They had Ishmael. He was sent away. And then uh, eventually, um, the Lord did provide. And he promised that Abraham would have a, uh, a son, and, he, and Isaac was born. And this must have been the greatest thrill. Um, have a little experience with this. Um, wanting to have children and expecting to have children and then having it not happen is, a, you know, a troubling situation. And there are all kind of answers for that. And I think God provides a lot of answers for that. Um, but I know the, the anticipation of wanting to have a child and not being able to conceive was you know situation in my life for several years and then something happened and it happened and happened <laughs> yeah. but anyway uh, she was very um, uh, Sarah was very nervous about not being able to provide the child so she did have this other child born but then when Isaac came this was absolutely the most wonderful miracle uh, in the world. And of course, if we only realized, if only everybody realized what a miracle a birth is, what a wonderful gift of God that is. Uh, it, and it surely is. It is a miracle, and it is probably the joy of most everybody's life. Sometimes it's not, but there are remedies for that too. At any rate, uh, someone will always be around to love a newborn baby if they have a chance. But at any rate, Sarah and, uh, and Abraham were so delighted. The joy was just wonderful when uh, Isaac was born. Now the Lord was gracious. This is uh, Genesis 21. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and he did for Sarah what he had promised. God will provide is the title. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the very time God promised him, Abraham gave him the name Isaac and to the son, to the son that Sarah bore. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would have children, and yet I had borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian born to Abraham, was mocking uh, and she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son. So you know the rest of that story. And uh, the son, and they went away. And uh, Isaac became the absolute 
apple of Abraham's <coughs> eye. He loved him dearly, and Sarah loved him dearly. And um, this is the troubling part of the story. This is where it gets to where somebody says, I don't know why this story's in the Bible. It really, it bothers me that it's even there. <clears throat> okay, that's sending him away. And, uh, oh, by the way, when they sent him away, I said God provided for Hagar and Ishmael very well. And then we go on to chapter 22. Now, sometime later, after all this drama has occurred, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Um, the Bible says, and I looked this up to confirm it, God does not tempt. God cannot be tempted, and God cannot tempt any man. He will not tempt any man. But there's a difference in tempting and testing. Uh, tempting is to do something that usually will benefit the person who's doing it. And you are tempted to do something because you think you have something to gain out of it. Testing is a different matter altogether. It is to assay, to find out what the worth of the material is that you're testing. You're, and sometimes of course, God knows before he tests anybody what the worth of that material is. He knows that Jesus Christ died for everybody, no matter who. And so there's a great worth in that life. But the person who is being tested very often doesn't know <coughs> what the worth of uh, that life <coughs> is to God. So the test is really for the benefit of the one being tested. But this is a very tough test. That, uh, that is going to happen here. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to Abraham, Abraham, and he replied, I am here. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there, as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, and I will tell you where to go. Did I hear you right? <laughs> uh, did you say take this son that we long for and prayed for and received and, and raised? Uh, he is now, a, you know, a young man, uh, and you're taking, you're asking me to sacrifice my son. I don't see that in the text. I just see the words, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey and took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him to go. On the third day, the third day, now he's been contemplating that for two days that he would be giving, offering this son, Isaac, whom he loved dearly at the burnt offering. Now I cannot imagine that. This was a different culture and a different time, but I can't imagine that it was ever something that the human being could get, you know, his head and heart around. Why is this necessary? What are, what's going on here? Now remember, this is a test now. This is not a temptation, this is a test. And he has given him the specific things to do. And Abraham, did you know this, has not questioned him. He hasn't raised his fist, he hasn't cried out. He is a, a being obedient. He is doing what God told him to do, no matter if it doesn't make sense to him or not. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship the Lord and we will come back to you. 
Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered him, God himself will provide the lamb. Remember that verse. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar, and he arranged the wood, and he bound his son Isaac on it, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket there was a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Um, that is a grand metaphor. And, you know, as I was reading it through the week, uh, or particularly yesterday, most of the day, I was reading it and I thought about what a grand picture this is of the plan of salvation. Um, of course, Abraham is a metaphor of God. He is the father. He is the one, you know, that is really in charge of everything. Um, Jesus Christ is his son. And he is, um, in his infinite and universal and eternal wisdom knows that there has to be a sacrifice made because of sin. All of sin, short of the glory of God. Uh, if he is going to have a plan of salvation to redeem people from the wages of sin, which is death, uh, he has got to make the appropriate sacrifice. And so God the Father takes this son, Jesus Christ, and he loves more than anything in the universe, and the eternal universe, and he offers him as a sacrifice. He provides the sacrifice. And who is let, who is free because of that sacrifice? And that's me, and that's you, and that's everybody who listens to the word of God and who believes God, believes God, and it is counted to him. Abraham believed God, and it was counted for righteousness. You believe God, and it is counted to you for righteousness. Uh, God will provide the sacrifice. It does not have to be you if you accept that gracious and unspeakable gift of God, that wonderful gift of God that he would sacrifice his son for you. Um, so that is the grand metaphor here that we're seeing in this. Um, and of course the Bible is so written that we see the same themes addressed over and over again. But this is in flesh and blood experience and so we can kind of relate to that. Um, The angel of the Lord then called out to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. 
your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And of course, Abraham is the, 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 the founder of the faith. Faith being um, defined as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So faith is substance. It has something you can get hold of. But it's the things that you hope for, you can reach for, and they will be real. And the evidence of things unseen, walking that path, not knowing where you're going, but knowing that the Lord will provide whatever it is that you need if you are walking in his will. Um, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful story, and I think um, it, it it's, gets your attention very quickly when you start relating to the human relationships that are there. And I just almost couldn't get hold of the thought. You, know, you put yourself in the place of, uh, you always put yourself in the parables. You put yourself in the scripture and say, what if God called on me? and ask me to sacrifice, uh, what would I do, what would I think, what would I say? Um, Abraham gave us a model for saying, uh, you know, I, I will provide. You walk in obedience and I will provide. So I, I think that is a lesson that we can get hold of today, that no matter where we are, what our circumstances are, God knows them, He hears them, <coughs> and even while we are still praying, He answers us. I love that thought. Uh, while we are speaking, He prays, and He, I mean, while we are while we are still praying, he is answering our prayers. So that is a, uh, a wonderful evidence of the faith that Abraham held up for us to look at. Um, the story goes on, we'll, we'll probably continue with this in, in, in later weeks, but the story goes on you know, that all of the promises that God made to Abraham, every single one of them, came to pass because he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And, of course, that is our uh, mission today, to believe that God will provide. And I can just testify to how many times, how many times I have um, kind of been at my wits end and said, Lord, if you only, <laughs> you only answer this, you know, I, and I, I try to do the bargain thing, you know, I will, I don't know, I'll do something better, I'll do something uh, more, I will, I will, I will make myself uh, a, a better disciple, and the fact is, I can't remember a single time, whether it happened or not, the way I was hoping that I have been disappointed that God has not attended and given me comfort and given me hope. And I had a lot of reason to think for a little while in the last couple of months that I, I, I just wasn't going to be able to get up and, and resume my life. And it looked like that was the way it was. And uh, I am convinced, though, that the Lord will provide, and so I, I prayed, and I prayed, and I thank you for praying with me. And this lesson really, you know, turned on lights for me. I just saw the, the stars, the shooting stars here. Whatever the situation is, God knows it, and he will provide. Amen. I thought maybe I would use, I, I do want to turn to the 20th Psalm and read you just a couple of verses for that, this, because it was 
this is the, the benediction. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of God protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all of your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desires of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious, and we will lift up our banners in the name of our Lord. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. They are brought to their knees and they fall, but we rise up and stand firm. O oh Lord, answer us when we call. And that's another amen. amen. And of course, this story all took place on Mount Moriah. Um, and I did, I did want to say something about Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is the place where we go when we are being tested. And there, God sees us and we see him. And that's what Mount Moriah means. It is the place where you meet and feel and know the presence of God. And of course, Mount Moriah was where Isaac, where they built the altar to sacrifice Isaac and the Lord provided the sacrifice instead of his son. And Mount Moriah was where David uh, wanted to build the temple and he was denied the right to build it, but his son Solomon built it. And the temple foundation is still there. Of course, it's got the Dome of the Rock on it right now, but uh, the the, the biblical prophecy is that the temple will be back there one of these days. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Sissy. It's so good to have you back. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, a few announcements. The Joy Group, next Monday, will meet in the parking lot at 1030 to go to Ark Building. The day change, the federal government has a, honored the Sabbath and transferred tax day to Monday, the 16th. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then on May 19th, Friday, the Global Impact <laughs> Missions will start a date and time change on that. Okay. Are there any announcements or any concerns of the class? UMW meets tomorrow. UMW tomorrow? Tomorrow. tomorrow, and we have uh, Dale Tutter as our primary speaker, and he is bringing us insights into the Lent, into Lent, or the Lenten season. Good. Very you know, good. I guess everyone knows by now, but we made our budget at church. Praise God. No. Yeah, that's yes. wonderful. That's Praise wonderful, God. yes. Hallelujah. So, Thank yes. you for that. Any other announcements? Time changes next week. Uh, yes, yeah, Sunday. Yeah. We'll all be early. Yeah. <laughs> Spring forward. Spring forward. <clears throat> all right. Would our sainted one come forth and Saint give Joker. the humor of the day? Saint Joker. Saint Joker. You looking for someone, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> As I get older, I realize I talk to myself because there are times I need expert advice. <laughs> I consider in style to be the clothes that still fit. My people skills are just fine. It's my tolerance for idiots that needs work. <laughs> the biggest lie I tell myself is I don't need to write it down. I'll remember it. 
I have days when my life is just a tent away from a circus. <laughs> These days, on time is where is when I get there. Even duct tape can't fix it, but it sure does muffle the sound. <laughs> Lately, I've noticed people my age are so much older than I am. <laughs> when I was a child, I thought nap time was punishment. Now it feels like a mini vacation. <laughs> Some days I have no idea what I'm doing out of bed. I thought growing old would take longer. Aging sure has slowed me down, but it hasn't shut me up. I still haven't learned to act my age. Enjoy humor. It's all we have left if love doesn't work. What was this one, Mama? The golfer's goodbye. Yeah. Uh, a close friend of ours, Bob, had passed away. We took our eight-year-old son to the graveside service. He was in awe the entire time. After the casket was lowered, Bob's grandchildren gave each person at the service a golf ball. Bob had been an avid golfer and his widow decided to drop golf balls into the grave instead of flowers. We smiled and joked as we each took our turn. When we finished dropping the balls, our son speaking in his outside voice had everyone laughing when he said, Mom, it's a good thing your friend wasn't a bowler. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> 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 